Hi everyone, my name is Artyom and this is Non-Extractive Architecture Research Project. We are streaming now from the Zattere, Venice, Italy, and I am happy to introduce Maxim Rachmaninka as a part of our research project. Maxim Rachmaninka is a designer and researcher working at the cutting edge of design and architecture, exploring new forms of urban living and emerging technologies. He is a founder of a Center of Special Technologies a design studio whose work is pushing the boundaries of housing and urban design and also the project lead of DOMA, a cooperative shared ownership housing platform for equitable housing. Thanks for joining us today and I am passing the microphone to Maxim. Is it good enough? Yeah, all good. Let's start. Um, okay, so again, thanks for having me and me as a kind of representative body of the Center for Special Technologies, uh, which team I represent. Um, the type of work we do is quite different, but today I'm going to show things that are kind of aligned with the themes of um, non-extractive architecture as was introduced to me through a short walk uh, around here. Um, the, the team is quite small, we are around 10 people and, you know, like, uh, the work is kind of so focuses on these systematic things that, you know, we are an, are an architecture office, but we don't do one client one project, um, things. Uh, and the only thing that I will show you today that is a bit not obviously connected to the general theme is the project that I should mention because, um, right now we are uh, so deep uh, into it and it's it would be hard to kind of present anything without saying a few words about it uh, and it's uh, it's also the only project that we do in the country where our office is based which is ukraine kiev and um, in kiev we have uh, a holocaust site one of the most important holocaust sites and it's called babinyar and um, the weird thing about it is that during soviet times it was somehow um, obliterated and the territory has changed so much. Here you can see uh, how it looks in 1943 and now. And this is the project where we use kind of forensic architecture-esque um, techniques to reconstruct the terrain and to do all of these things. But then um, at some point you will see intersections between this and also some of the kind of domestic architecture things that we do. So here's the terrain is made in a digital model for you. It's probably very simple and obvious things to do. But then as you see here, you know, this is the difference between uh, how it looks now and how it was back in the 40s. So the work is mostly about figuring out where all of the events happened, aligning maps. We are actually producing a cartographic platform for the foundation to understand, help understand and communicate how the events happened. But also what you see here are uh, an attempt to basically locate images uh, that were taken in Babinyar. And again, the shocking thing about this place is that until um, February of this year, basically, there were still arguments about where the, the massive amount of people were murdered. And um, this is kind of an attempt to bring information to, to somehow make sure that we understand what happened and where, and to very carefully map all of these events. So um, yeah, like in the end, we're producing something like this, where you can see where the photographs were taken. Also, we are working with a lot of testimonies, kind of trying to structure them and uh, making it possible for one to to read them and see where certain events took place and also working on these 3D reconstructions of um, the events. So um, this is the database of all the testimonies where, you know, we work with researchers who use this to basically filter a certain name of the street or some location and try to figure out what, uh, what happened in that location. And then forensically, we are able to we construct those scenes, which are again, uh, quite historically important. So this project is, is something that we're fully busy with now. And it's, um, it's meant to be open in September when it will be an 80th anniversary of the tragedy. And basically, yeah, um, 
that's kind of why we are a bit withdrawn from, from other projects, which I'm going to be presenting you now, which are a bit more obviously indirectly connected to the theme of non-extractive architecture. And uh, DOMA is this project about decentralized uh, ownership of real estate. And, uh, you know, if we talk about non-extractive, it also can be looked at from the perspective of finance. So obviously a lot of, um, a lot of people are struggling with housing crisis. And, and um, there is this paper that was written as a critique of Thomas Piketty's capital, which basically is arguing that um, the main reason why capital price is growing faster than incomes is housing. If you look at all capital, it kind of, um, it actually, if you, if you uh, divide it by housing, you get a kind of the correlation with total amount of wealth that we have. And um, the project, again, is somehow based on the fact of us being architects, but at the same time, kind of, you know, participating in the bunch of projects where people try to ask us to make smarter homes, make smaller kitchens, do some smarter things about how to organize space. But then it all comes back to the question of uh, structural things like, you know, like wealth inequality specifically, how it kind of is uh, reinforcing itself through housing. And um, here, the, the, the main idea of this project is to connect existing residential units, existing flats with um, the users of DOMA in a different way. So the very two basic, um, tools that we've devised to, to make this possible. Uh, the first one of them is tokenization or fractionalization of ownership. Again, it's something that can be easily problematized. It can be looked, should be looked at in a very careful way. But um, the idea of people being able to pull resources together and purchase pieces of property was important for us. And, for instance, at this point um, where we work is impossible to do legally. Like if me and my friends wanted to, to invest in and buy some sort of piece of property, it wouldn't be possible. Uh, this, the second basic mechanism is equity distribution. And it's um, kind of, uh, again, this simple idea that uh, came up from us looking at the market dynamics in Kiev. And we looked at something which is called price to rent ratio. So um, that's what people use a lot to understand how good of an investment certain property is. And um, in Kiev, price to rent ratio is very low. It means that basically like apartments are quite cheap compared to rent. So for 12 years of rent, you can purchase an apartment. Uh, and uh, the idea here is that while tenants would live within DOMA properties, uh, they would slowly generate uh, shares of equity because now we fractionalized ownership. We made it available for people to, to purchase in a distributed way. We can also share back some of this equity with uh, tenants who actually arguably contribute to the value of the city in a way. Um, so uh, at this point, we function with DOMA as a research-oriented project. And one thing that we uh, developed with this uh, game, uh, it was designed for three cultural institutions in the US and the show was um, canceled because of COVID, but we made this kind of simulation based on three American cities. This one is based on Philadelphia. And we looked at um, property dynamics in Philly and basically tried to make this kind of simplified, um, obviously uh, much, much more simplified city, but still one where you could figure out the main dynamics which are happening in the city. There's still the proper ratio between renters and owners. There's a similar dynamic of property prices and stuff like that. So actually this one is available at Play the Domado City. You can explore it yourself. But um, in this talk, I'm just, I just show it that Next to the second thing that I'm going to show, which is much more kind of one of the kind experiment, this is also an attempt where we kind of look at things on a more systematic level. Uh, and we continue this work now with um, an uh, institution called 221A based in Vancouver, 
And with them, we basically develop um, a Vancouver-based um, prototype where some of the other functionality that is not in the game will be uh, possible to, to see. So um, the second part, though, is this kind of very much hands-on experimentation part where we actually managed to get a hold of one apartment uh, based uh, again in, in Kiev. It was relatively cheap if you look if you look at like Western markets. It was like around uh, fifty thousand euros, and we got it in a way where you know without legal way to do that, we made a sheet where we kind of pulled resources together, purchased it, and we also talked about how to try to figure out what is the best way, what is the best stack of basically making this possible. Um, but also at the same time on a physical level, we very carefully documented the process of working with this. So I was uh, actually like in a bar with a friend who works uh, at Climate Kick, which is this big fund which uh, finances sustainability related projects all across Europe. And I was kind of in a software pitch in Doma and she said, this is probably would make a lot of sense if you look at the because we work with existing flats. If you look at one flat and try to understand what is the kind of uh, uh, even footprint of, of making that possible, right? Because the flats in Kiev, they mostly are this kind of derelict Soviet looking things. This one actually was much nicer than uh, many. And then we, as I said, we kind of carefully documented everything that was here. We made these uh, scans where you can see how this place was changing through time. This is a kind of a deconstruction project um, that, that um, took place there. And um, this is how it works now. It's at a place where also currently I live. And uh, so this is my bedroom, my bathroom. And this door, when it's shut, it turns into, this turns into kind of a tiny hotel room is if you want and this becomes our office at this point we are 12 people so it's a bit jam-packed but uh, it's all cozy and I, I still think sweet um so yeah i mean this um this place is very special for us and we also try to research it in a way that uh, that we can so this again is this kind of fly through these three layers of um of scans and uh, in the process of deconstruction, we not, not only took care of uh, recording all of the stuff that we got out of the apartment, but we also you know, collected all the receipts. And there's actually a lot of receipts if you want to make an, even a simple renovation project, but then we put them all into BIM model. So these are sheets that connect to something like this, which is this kind of, I mean, what you see here is Revit and Brian and Grasshopper, and they both kind of have the same data that travels across these platforms. So we kind of use this um, standardized protocol to record all of the entities within this um, apartment, including everything that we got out of the apartment and everything that we also um, purchased. And now we try to make these simple cards where, you know, we kind of divided everything into products, labor, and uh, uh, sort of like uh, types of action. And then for each of them, we have a set of parameters, like for say for materials, we were able to calculate um, sort of the carbon footprint of them and stuff like that. So this was again an attempt of like, you know, like just hacking around with what we have very close to us. We're doing this reconstruction project and we recorded all the stuff that we dealt with and we tried to see what kind of impact it has. Of course, in this process, bumping into a lot of interesting questions and issues that we then problematized in different other things. So this was, for instance, a pavilion that we did for the Belize Biennale. Um, and this is all the stuff that all the stuff that we demolished was kind of stored. Uh, in a very lucky way, we got this huge pavilion to exhibit it. And also we made this um, footprint of the apartment back in the pavilion. And we were able to do some performances there that you will see in a second. But 
I mean, this is actually very funny because yesterday we were in Japanese pavilion and it's almost literally the same uh, kind of idea. And it was super interesting for me because we sent, uh, I sent all of this stuff to my team and they were like, oh, they printed QR codes, yeah. and stuff like that. So uh, this is the kind of, uh, again, uh, not fully edited footage, just some stuff from the apartment. We have some friends who come over and, you know, we hang out with them, sometimes talk to them. And um, with, uh, with these, um, this video is kind of trying to show the connection between that pavilion and uh, the apartment. So here you see the actress who was performing in this pavilion and here she's in the same space here. So this is actually something that we have shot, but we never managed to edit. It's still something that we look forward to doing actually a lot because we also have scans of those pavilion with all the stuff. So it's, uh, it's pro probably going to be our first uh, kind of major attempt to, to play with Unreal Engine 5. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, uh, this work is kind of, again, is, as you see, it's quite experimental. And every time we work with things like this, we also learn a lot about like technical things, which is actually the main expertise that we have in the office that we also sell to clients. Um, and then, yeah, we also produce stuff like this, which are these kind of more like uh, with the video work that, you know, just try to kind of, this is like, I think it's one minute long, but it tries to see this process of interaction between a vacuum cleaner and the person. And actually, if you, if you see there, the vacuum cleaner sees the person in a way and it kind of draws this uh, sort of Vitruvian man type of image of the person. That was the whole reason why we had an actress and the vacuum cleaner interact to make a drawing made by a, Anton, which is the name of our vacuum cleaner. Um, and obviously there are other kind of images here that kind of contextualize this process. So, um, and the kind of the thing that was immediately relevant in terms of what we talked with Artem about was this idea of material passports. And of course we got very close to that when we were um, working with, um, um, we were working with all of these renovation projects and stuff like that. So for example, we also have a bunch of sensors in the apartment, which measure temperature, humidity, air quality, and um, kind of light levels in the, in the space, uh, which again, this data is, we don't always know what to do with it. We often generate things that, you know, they're just like there and it's hard to explain why we did that. This was interesting just to see, even from the perspective of like, you know, if we, there's a lot of people in the room, how everyone feels, whether we have enough air to breathe. My idea with this beautiful door, which shuts my space from the office is not really working well in summer because you want to have cross ventilation. So then you kind of, I mean, it's again, these things are, are arguably useful to play with, uh, even from the architectural standpoint. Um, my next slide has uh, audio. Uh, can we can we somehow play it? If I if I so, I can use the microphone and cool. turn on the sounds. video that is coming soon oops and um, it's done in collaboration with dark matter lab on the commission of climate kick um, 
Yeah, I mean, like the it, it's also like edited by this person who's a techno DJ, so it's a bit <laughs> it's a bit more intense than I wanted it to be. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, but the general gesture is relatively simple. Uh, it, I'll explain it to you. So uh, we have a window that is also part of our office. Uh, we got it from certain people. We went to see those people in order to figure out where they got the metallic profiles, the plastic profiles, and all the other uh, elements of the window fittings. And then we basically do some, oh, sorry. Yeah, then we basically do something like this, where we have this kind of mandala looking matrix where you know, everything gets disassembled. You see the video, like you see the, all the elements of the window in this kind of structure. And it also is divided into layers. So the front layer is a plastic, the middle layer is metal and the back layer is uh, glass. So, uh, and obviously we also tried to see how, uh, what is the information we can learn about those things. We also bumped into all of these opacity of supply chains, right? So like for instance, the company that produces glass boxes, I don't know how it's called in English, but it's basically glass that is sealed uh, in a couple of layers. Exactly. Like, so, so they were completely unwilling to, because they considered their intellectual property, how they get their stuff from and what they put together. Uh, with the plastic profiles, it was much easier. And for metal, we also learned that, you know, it came from Australia to Germany and then it, it, those things are quite weird to untangle, like, like uh, the company that makes profiles buys uh, oil in Russia. So, you know, those things were interesting to work with and also, get, again, as a test that then manifests in a simple thing like this, which also is a part of Dark Matter's larger project, which I think was kind of introduced by Indy a bit here. Uh, around this kind of idea of persisting things and this idea of like self-sovereign objects that own in self, uh, themselves and stuff like that. So if, if that is possible and things can own themselves and can do things based on smart contracts or whatever, this was just an kind of a simple exercise on a practical level to see what would be the information that those things can be governed based on. And it's uh, not so simple as if you try to untangle those things um yeah i guess this was rumbly but very fast uh, i i artem told me i have 40 minutes which honestly like i think the longest presentation i've done was uh 20 minutes or something like sure sure and yeah so, I mean, just to sum up, like I have some other stuff here, but I mean, generally speaking, this is the type of work that we do. And um, um, there's also like, I mean, all of these things that kind of are woven as these threads that come together. And, you know, sometimes we experiment with things and in the end it's becomes some sort of service that we can uh, offer to, clients like simple 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 like 3d scanning or bim or stuff like that but uh, in the end this kind of framework of network homes is basically an attempt to look at what surrounds us immediately in terms of physical spaces that we inhabit and try to figure out what are the kind of networks of relationships that produce those things and the idea of the project is to follow those networks untangle them and then basically try to make sense of them. And um, yeah, I mean, basically this is the, the core of my presentation. We are on Instagram and most of other social media at spatialtech.info. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess uh, I had a walk through the Palazzo where I saw a lot of uh, kind of references that are weirdly the same to what we are looking at. So it would be interesting to talk and to see what you guys have been up to and if anything of this um, makes sense to you and if I should stop at any of these to kind of talk about them in a more extensive way.